Okay, uh, now, once again, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. James Yellowlees. Uh, he's going to be talking about something that's going to be connecting all of the course together, and we're only on the, four, uh, the sixth class today. So thank you very much um, for joining us, everyone. And I think this is going to be a very interesting and uh, enlightening uh, presentation by Dr. Yellowlees. And he's going to be talking about Japan Africa development and we have a lot of experience in, in that he and I and uh, we've worked together on a number of different projects so and he's an excellent speaker so I'm really looking forward to this thank you all right James you're okay good well welcome everybody I'm glad to be with you today uh, we're going to look at uh, Japan Africa development um, and I think it's very topical because as we know, Africa is going through some challenges now with coronavirus. Um, it's really creating some, some big problems. Um, there are debt uh, issues related to Chinese uh, loans to uh, many countries. Uh, so anyway, I think Japan's role in Africa development is extremely important. And um, when we look at Japan, uh, Japan's efforts, we look at aid. Uh, which is largely done through JICA. We'll explain about JICA um, further along. Uh, and uh, also trade. Increasingly, trade has become important. Um, until recently, the last couple of years, I think a lot of the African countries have been looking for more aid. Um, but in the uh, last TICAD conference, which is organized by the Japanese government in Yokohama in 2019, uh, one of the main themes was from aid to trade, meaning that uh, don't expect um, sort of handouts from Japan, but be prepared to trade and create trading partnerships. So uh, this is a really key driver now, I think, uh, with a lot of African countries to develop their economies, uh, to sell products to Japan, to work with Japan and other markets. Uh, investment is largely done through the private sector. We'll look at some major investments by uh, some of the major players. A lot of the key uh, global Japanese companies are very involved in Africa in different areas. Uh, I think that will continue, uh, although I think there needs to be, uh, I think more effort on both sides from the African country sides to prepare for possible investors, to make the terms uh, acceptable for them and to ensure that the uh, investments are secure and protected because um, there is a lot of corruption in, in African countries, um, depending on the country and different levels, but large sums of money will disappear um, and uh, the rulers may escape and there's a new government and they don't know anything about it. So there has to be kind of sovereign guarantees for some of the investment. Um, and then we see partnerships uh, between, say, Japanese companies and organizations and their counterparts in Africa. Uh, also, there are cases where uh, Japanese companies are teaming up with uh, companies from the UK, EU, America to work on different projects. I think we'll see more and more of this because it uh, deflects the risk somewhat if they're different partners. Also, um, it helps, I think, to bring different resources to bear and uh, can help politically as well. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right. So, um, I think for Japan's activity in Africa, it's relatively recent. Um, as we know, in the Japanese rebuilding the post war economy in the 50s, there was a lot of uh, work you know, in Japan to rebuild industry. Um, the Korean War was supplied, uh, the Allied forces were largely supplied by Jap from Japan, uh, which helped to rebuild the economy. Uh, Japan became very involved in uh, work in China and other countries in the region. Um, and of course, America was the big market. Um, and then for other areas, uh, imports from Australia, Canada, et cetera, uh, oil from the Middle East. So Africa was not at the top of the list. But uh, we see that from the 1960s, there was some initially some activity, um, especially with South Africa, uh, because South Africa was considered to be the most developed uh, nation in Africa, uh, probably the safest in terms of um, sort of a European culture uh, there. 
Um, so a lot of Japanese companies worked there. It's interesting because there was apartheid then, which meant essentially that uh, there was like a system where the whites were number one, uh, Asians, and then the blacks. So it was very set in the society. Um, and it was interesting because uh, in a lot of cases, Japanese were classified as honorary whites, which meant that uh, they could go anywhere in South Africa if they were considered to be honorary whites. So <laughs> kind of an interesting designation. Um, but we see that uh, as apartheid came under attack from uh, people in, in America, the U UK, et cetera, then those countries had to pull out of their investments and uh, reduce their trade with South Africa as long as apartheid was in place. Japan was able to then capitalize on that and continue working with South Africa for many years until some of the international pressure caught up with Japan and they had to kind of quietly uh, decline, you know, and, and reduce their activity, let's say. Um, then we see that uh, Japan then started to work uh, with other countries. Um, we'll see in a, a map in a moment that Kenya was one of the first ones in the 1970s. Uh, also Egypt, which we tend to forget is part of Africa sometimes. Uh, a lot of uh, presence there, uh, largely tourism and, uh, and some trade related. Um, so a lot of the effort uh, in efforts in, in Africa were from the Japanese perspective, a lot of resource based. So to acquire oil or gas or uh, minerals uh, was largely the intent of a lot of the in investment. We see now that there are um, 796 uh, op Japanese offices, operations in Africa. So we see that, say from the 70s until currently, it's been pretty strong growth. Um, uh, it uh, doesn't compare in a sense to the Chinese presence, but it's a very strong presence. Okay, next one. Okay. So we see this uh, map, it's not coming out that clearly, but um, anyway, <clears throat> we can see that uh, the number of Japanese uh, companies or organizations with operations in Africa, we see at the very bottom, uh, South Africa, 282. Uh, so that's uh, the uh, largest number by far. Um, even the countries nearby there Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe is very few. Um, we can see though Mozambique, uh, where there was the oil spill uh, the other day, um, unfortunately, uh, but uh, it's a very attractive area. Uh, further up, we see Kenya uh, with 54. Um, so it's really kind of leading the Eastern Africa contingent, if you will. And uh, it's, I think it's probably familiar for a lot of Japanese people. Toyota has a major operation there. To Tsusho, their trading uh, company arm has a big presence there. So a lot of the companies and groups are using Kenya as a base to get into um, some of the other areas. Uh, Rwanda, uh, we'll get into in a moment as well, uh, is really developing as an economy. Um, they have developed a sister city relationship uh, between Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, and Kobe in Japan, which is really benefiting both. Uh, Rwanda is really a, a very good developing economy. Uh, Uganda, also very up and coming. We can see this is all kind of linked through Kenya, um, as the other countries are landlocked. And up the top, we see Egypt uh, with 50. Um, so we can see that uh, then it's really a big sprinkling. Ghana has 44 on the west side. That's the largest uh, group. So we can see that otherwise it's fairly small. Uh, but I think growing. So it's, um, we'll see that it's really more diverse than I think than a lot of people would think. Okay, next slide, please. One of the key players from Japan is the Japan International Cooperation Agency or JICA uh, in Africa. Um, it became up, began operating uh, in Africa in earnest in the 1990s. Um, the South African office was opened in 1997. Uh, they now have 27 offices in Africa, which is very, very impressive. Um, JICA, as you may know, um, is largely involved. It's a Japanese agency that's involved with uh, development. Uh, they do a lot of grants and very low-cost loans, uh, sometimes even interest-free loans. Um, they really develop infrastructure. Um, so 
in a lot of countries around the world and South America and other countries as well, especially developing nations, Southeast Asia. Uh, they're very involved in developing roads and bridges. Uh, in Laos, for example, uh, they're very involved in uh, managing the hydroelectric dams and operations, which are huge in Laos. Uh, but JICA is really involved in helping them to manage those. So we see that anyway, they're involved in a lot of projects. Um, currently with coronavirus, they're helping a lot uh, because uh, JICA has been very involved in helping to build hospitals, um, helping to train doctors, nurses, technicians, and sending people from Japan uh, for one or two or three years uh, in these capacities. So a lot of great Japanese people have gone and have served with JICA and uh, you know, set up hospitals, have helped manage uh, sort of tri tribal village visits uh, to, to look after people medically, to train the doctors and uh, nurses on uh, new medical techniques and technologies. Uh, a lot of work also on hygiene, uh, so clean water, which uh, a lot of people in Africa we see now as the number of new cases is kind of skyrocketing. One of the problems is that there isn't enough, enough uh, clean water for people to drink, to wash their hands with. Um, so it's thought to, that that's one of the main reasons for that for it spreading so easily, especially in South Africa right now. Uh, but JICA has been involved really very much in helping to purify water, uh, to develop new water sources, um, and just teaching people, I think, basic hygiene. So anyway, it's providing a lot of good, uh, good work. Okay, next one, please. Um, just looking at the projects, uh, interestingly, there are over 300 significant projects uh, in Africa now that uh, JICA is conducting. Um, there are also a lot of smaller projects. Uh, typically, JICA will do surveys and uh, initial market research for projects. Um, they will um, kind of identify uh, working with the local governments, uh, let's say in somewhere like Botswana, uh, they'll work together to identify what are the, the priorities for that government and for its people to develop. Is it clean water? Is it a new railway system? Uh, is it a, a fixing roads or bridges? So they'll discuss this with them. They'll then do feasibility studies uh, and then they will, um, the, the country will then apply for loans uh, or grants uh, with JICA. And JICA will look at their ability to, and grants, grants are very important because they don't have to be repaid. Um, so these are very welcome, obviously. Also the loans are generally very low cost. So we call them soft loans. And these are generally 0.5% a year or 1% a year, which is very low. And sometimes uh, the countries don't have to pay anything back for five years. So very nice terms. Um, one interesting project is in Kenya, uh, the Mombasa Bridge Project. Uh, Mombasa is the port uh, that is the most important port really in, in, in all of Eastern Africa. And uh, the Chinese uh, government uh, did a deal with the Kenyan government to create a railway line from Mombasa to Nairobi, the capital of Kenya. Um, the Chinese method is to uh, develop a loan, a loan uh, which they will provide. Um, often they will uh, attach strings to this loan, meaning that um, they will provide all the materials for the construction. So let's say it's $3 billion for the loan and the government gets the loan, uh, they then have to pay for all the services, but all of the equipment for building the railway goes from China. All of the workers uh, are building the railway go from China. Um, all the technology comes from China. So there's not much in terms of technology transfer or jobs or providing supplies and services to this. So essentially, and the, the terms are usually two to 3%, uh, which are sort of semi soft loans, but not that, not that really great terms. Uh, so that, you know, I think about a $3 billion loan for a railway, it probably cost $300 million. So about a 10th of that. So where did the rest of that money go? Is a big question the Kenyan people are asking now. Um, 
and they have to pay this back now. These are sovereign backed lo loans. So the Kenyan government and the people are on the hook for paying this back. Interestingly, there was a case in, uh, this went to court case in Kenya, and the court re uh, ruled that the loan was illegal, and so the Kenyan government should not have to pay it back. So this has become quite a controversy. In the midst of all this, um, the Kenyan government wanted to improve the port and the facilities and bridge and everything. So they approached the Japanese government uh, because of the problem with China to try to offset um, that problem by working with JICA uh, to provide grants, uh, low cost loans to develop, further develop the port, upgrade the port, build a bridge. So build all the infrastructure of the actual port uh, with grants and very low cost loans, uh, which will really help. So it's interesting because I think in this case, the Kenyan government is playing Japan and China off against each other somewhat, but in the sense that Japan is uh, kind of the savior in this case where they're providing a, an essential service, uh, but at a very low rate. And, and, and part of that is with grants. So that's, that's good. We also see Burundi uh, health support projects, as I mentioned, uh, South Sudan. Um, as you may know, South Sudan has had a lot of uh, problems. Uh, uh, it's basically became independent from Sudan. Uh, there's been war, internal war. So a lot of problems there. The self-defense forces from Japan went to South Sudan uh, for about four years, uh, eventually came back uh, because it was kind of unsafe and difficult. So, uh, but there's a lot of need there for rebuilding from the war, um, from uh, for developing the people, etc. So uh, they constructed a freedom bridge, uh, which goes across the Nile River there, uh, which is very significant. And they're involved in several projects. I think they have about 12 or 13 projects going just in South Sudan. So this is very significant. Okay, next um, slide, please. Okay, so why are the Japanese involved in Africa? Um, one of the reasons is <clears throat> because, as I've mentioned, that there are resources there. Um, one of the key resources or set of resources which is quietly being looked at by Japanese companies is called rare earths. Rare earths are minerals um, and components that are used in building almost everything. So for iPhones, smartphones, um, for uh, electric vehicles, uh, for almost everything modern, um, these are essential. Uh, China has the most of these rare earths and they've also set up smelters in China to bring them in from South America, from Australia, from Africa. So they're trying to kind of corner the market. Uh, why is this dangerous for Japan? Because uh, when the Senkaku, Senkaku, Senkaku Island problem started um, a few years ago, uh, the Chinese were very upset that the Japanese uh, Tokyo To, uh, Ishara Shintaro's friend, bought the islands. Uh, they then uh, basically banned exports of rare earths to Japan. And this was a huge problem for Japanese manufacturers. So ever since that time, uh, Japan has been looking for sources around the world for rare earths. And you'll hear this more and more, uh, the importance of these. There are about 20 different uh, rare earths and uh, they, they vary in, um, in terms of importance and use. But, uh, uh, but the um, Republic of Congo is a very important source of a couple of very key rare earths. Um, global influence. So we see that Japan is considered to be the number three economy in the world. Um, it's influential in the world. Um, it wants to uh, be more better known, I guess, through the United Nations, etc. So when countries vote on different things, uh, so if Japan wants to become more visible at the United Nations through getting a seat at the Security Council, it needs the com countries to vote for them. So if you have good relations with companies, you're giving them aid, you're investing in them, you're doing trade together, you can develop the relations. And if you ask them to vote for you, then they will. Um, so this becomes increasingly important. We see that this is a big part of Chinese diplomacy where they are uh, using their loans and aid uh, to basically coerce countries into, they're not asking for 
the votes are demanding them. <laughs> so uh, we can see the problem with the WHO right now, uh, where uh, the head of the WHO was originally the foreign minister from Ethiopia and received a lot of loans and help from China, China before, and China is asking him to help them again. Uh, new markets, we see that uh, the Japanese economy is, is getting smaller, uh, fewer Japanese being born. Um, and so there's a need to get into other markets. So we see that with com companies like Fujifilm, for example, which has made a fantastic uh, recovery from being just a uh, film camera film company to a uh, pharma type company making all sorts of cosmetics uh, and a lot of good products. Um, so we see that they've developed medicine that was being used against Ebola and now is being used against the uh, coronavirus. So a very progressive company. So they've identified South Africa as one of their key markets for uh, developing partnerships, manufacturing, and then sort of exporting to all the other countries in, in Africa using uh, South Africa as a base. Uh, profitable investment opportunities. I think um, there are certain areas uh, in which uh, Japanese companies are looking for short-term or long-term investments uh, where they can be profitable. Uh, so often it follows that if JICA gets involved in doing some infrastructure work, then other companies, the trading companies like Itochu, uh, the construction companies like Komatsu, will come in after and do the next wave of investment. And uh, but now that sort of JICA has cleared the way for them and proven it's relatively safe. So this is where the the private sector works very closely with JICA and analyzing the situation and then trying to uh, come up with profitable uh, investments. Another really key area is the rivalry with China. So we see that China uh, is really trying to, throughout the world, um, be very dominant. Uh, and it's uh, using uh, loans uh, to, sometimes we say they're creating uh, debt traps for countries. So that uh, with Sri Lanka, for example, um, they gave the, the previous president of Sri Lanka a major loan to develop a port, which wasn't really necessary. Again, a, a $2 billion loan. And you know who, how the money was used, we're not sure. But anyway, but um, basically as Sri Lanka could not pay the loan back, then they had to give China full access to the port for 99 years. So this is what China is doing strategically to create debt traps where uh, countries are uh, forced to accede uh, mines or ports or things that, that China wants. Um, so I think uh, we see more and more, there's a, uh, the, the called the Indo-Pacific, uh, which involves Japan, America, uh, Vietnam, Australia, and, and India in particular. But this extends also to through the Indian Ocean to Africa. So we're gonna see more and more, this rival with China is going to be important. Um, so I think there's, it's not really stated clearly by the Japanese government, but it's very clear. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Okay, so if we look at uh, Japan versus China in Africa, uh, the total Chinese investment uh, from 2005 to this year is about $400 billion. Now, a lot of this is again in loans. Um, so in, in, in the sense they want the money back from the, the countries. Uh, so it's gonna be very interesting. It's gonna be very difficult for them to recover a lot of these loans. Uh, they just announced uh, recently that they'll uh, provide another $60 billion of loans this year, new loans for African countries. So it's gonna be very interesting. The total Japanese investment is uh, about 80 billion including grants uh, from the same period. So we see it's a much, much less uh, amount. Um, the Chinese investments are mainly loans, as I mentioned, uh, very few grants. Um, they're strategic because they're serving Chinese purposes, perhaps more than the local population. So uh, China will build railway because they want to transport their resources that they extract you know, to a port and then they can bring them to China. So we see a lot of that sort of thing. Um, so it's very difficult for the African countries to repay these loans. And basically there are a lot of them are renegotiating with China now, or trying to, 
um, and it's very difficult. And China's saying, well, we'll give you more loans. So uh, that's, uh, and there's strings attached. So often, uh, as I said, in the case of the Mombasa port, where uh, if there's a project, let's say a railway that's being built or a road, the uh, tools, uh, the, the ingredients, uh, the, everything that's used will be brought in from China, not sourced locally. The workers uh, will come from China. This is very important for China because as the global economy is slowing down uh, due to coronavirus, uh, one of the key problems for the Chinese Communist Party is jobs. And so they really need to keep jobs and there, there's a re reduction in jobs in China because uh, even if they're producing things, uh, you know, people around the world aren't able to buy it anymore. Or a lot of companies are pulling out of China uh, and moving to Southeast Asia and other areas. So it's uh, becoming very difficult. So they have to continue with these projects overseas so they can send workers out and keep them employed. And they're doing this throughout the world. Um, so often the, the uh, Chinese loans are often uh, kind of portrayed as debt traps. I mean, there are good investments and they do provide some good services. And so they, they do a lot of, build a lot of good roads and uh, bridges and things like that. A lot of infrastructural things, which are difficult to do, but uh, the loans are often too much. Uh, money is often going to the rulers of the countries. Uh, and so the, the people of the country are kind of on the hook to pay these loans back. And quite frankly, with the, the loans, with the current terms, they'll, they'll never be able to pay them back. So it's kind of a neo-colonialist um, approach. So we see that uh, in the uh, 18th, 19th centuries, early part of the 20th century, um, England, France, Belgium, Italy, Germany, etc., cetera, were um, in Africa and they, were, they all had their own colonies there. And they were basically running uh, the show and then bring diamonds out of South Africa and, and you know, bring the, the raw minerals, raw materials back to Europe, uh, then manufacturing with them. Uh, the, choc the cocoa for building chocolate, for making chocolate, you know, they're bringing from Ghana. And uh, the people were paid very poorly, etc. However, I think now uh, there's more of a social conscience in uh, Europe, especially with the EU, uh, America, Canada, and Japan. I think uh, people think you know the whole thing of fair trade um, has come up, meaning that uh, farmers in Africa should be paid a reasonable amount uh, for producing cocoa or other other products. Otherwise, you know they're just working, not surviving. They're not making anything, and the people here, uh, you know, are selling the chocolate then for let's say two thousand yen for a chocolate bar, and uh, getting most of the profit here. So I think that's uh, something the so social conscious of. Japan, uh, the other industrialized countries. However, this is not really in the social conscience of China or, or a lot of the Chinese people. It's kind of like a win-lose, we win, you lose. It's a we take, you, you give kind of mentality. So we call it neo-colonialist, which means that that's kind of the approach that to date China's been taking. Okay, next uh, one, please. So we see that um, the Japanese uh, grants, loans, and investment. Uh, so Japanese investment, the mixture of grants and loans, as I said, I think uh, the JICO system is very good. Um, it's a modern uh, ODA type system, overseas development type system. Um, JICO also worked together with um, overseas AG agencies from uh, America, the UK, EU, Canada, et cetera, to work together on projects, which is quite good. Um, we see more and more private sector investment. Uh, which is important. So companies like Toyota, for example, uh, setting up uh, auto production in Nairobi, uh, in Kenya, and then uh, service, customer service. So in this case, they set up the uh, plants. Uh, they have sent in expats from Japan to basically manage them, but they also have, they hire local people. Uh, they develop managers uh, within. So then uh, I think they hope that uh, they can't have operations in every country, but they can make the pro produce the automobiles and other auto uh, components, et cetera, there, and then export them to other countries in the region. We see some more and more uh, cooperation with US, UK, and EU firms. Uh, we'll look at a solar uh, project uh, in a further slide. 
Um, so we see that often uh, there's, um, you know, France has uh, deep relationships with its former colonies in uh, Western Africa. So we see that uh, there are problems with ISIS and other groups there. So France is really involved in trying to help to um, uh, alleviate that situation militarily. Uh, they're also working on payment, smart payment systems uh, in those countries. So I think their France is really trying to help them develop. So I think to, uh, if you want to work in some of those countries like Ivory Coast, et cetera, it's good to consider uh, partnerships with French firms that maybe they're active already. Uh, one maybe one way to do it. Uh, a lot of the Japanese uh, grants uh, and loans are very well considered. So they're kind of very careful. So Japan isn't just throwing money at, at African countries. I think their JICA with its 27 offices uh, throughout is doing very deep research into uh, you know, the feasibility of projects, uh, the cost, uh, the ability to pay back, the terms to pay back, the return for the society and, and business and government in, in those countries. So it tends to be much more cooperative and well thought out. So I think uh, some uh, representatives of African countries or companies think that you know, we'll, we'll just get money from Japan. It's not that easy because it's much more well thought out and considered and there, there are often systems in place. So for the, the, stra the strategy for a lot of um, African countries, and we deal with a lot of the embassies in Tokyo, and uh, they really don't know how to access uh, funding or investment. Uh, they all know JICA and they know, you know, that uh, JETRO that sort of thing, but that's about it. The J's, you know, Jake and Jetro. Other than that, they're they're really not sure how to approach uh, Ito Chu about investment or other groups. So and how to strategically approach it. So you have Jaika come in with initial surveys and investment, and then uh, followed by Ito Chu with the next wave of investment, bringing other Japanese partners and this sort of thing. Um, so anyway, it's much more thought out. I think in the case of China, they're throwing a lot of money at situations and probably a third of that money is going in as a um, uh, kind of graft. Uh, so they're, they're paying off the top two or three leaders in each country, a lot of money, and they're approving the loans. And um, so a lot of that money disappears, but that's part of the investment. That's why partly why the, the figures for China are so high because probably a third of what they invest there disappears. Um, and we see a lot more humanitarian projects. Uh, I think especially now, uh, I've been very impressed with what JICA is doing in terms of uh, hospitals and I think really stepping up now with COVID, uh, trying to create, uh, you know, COVID uh, hospital centers, uh, machinery, uh, medicine, and different things. So I think, uh, anyway, there's, I think there's a good track record of Japanese um, involvement in, in the different countries. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So um, these are just some um, uh, com companies in, that stand out, uh, Japanese companies that stand out uh, in Africa. So we mentioned Toyota uh, has a big presence in, in Kenya and Nairobi um, and is really involved in uh, developing the different markets. And uh, you know, I know people work at Toyota and have had some discussions about this. And I think it's very challenging for them because um, some of the countries are you know, not really safe. Uh, they're politically unstable. Uh, they're rebels uh, there, and so you know they have to consider these the risk factors in setting up operations. And um, there are uh, so-called strong men, you know, who are in power for 30 years. So it's basically that family runs the country, kind of thing. So there are different things you have to look at. But I think that said, I think they see that there's a growing middle class, uh, especially in Kenya and, and other countries that are developing more. Uh, they want cars. They want to drive. Toyota has a good name, uh, so there's a good thing there. I think they're really conscious of developing the people there as well. So as I said, for implants to have them uh, run by uh, Japanese expats, uh, then to raise the next managerial level and uh, the workers and get them trained uh, is very good. Jogmec, uh, for you may, may not know this, this is uh, probably a leading uh, company, uh, kind of government related, uh, private, private sector company that um, is very deeply involved in investment in uh, oil, gas, natural gas, and metals, and to some extent rare earths. So they're a real major player in the world. 
and so they're investing in a, a lot of uh, oil and gas. We see that uh, the uh, we can see the oil prices have gone down. Uh, the countries in Africa that really rely mainly on oil exports, Nigeria and other countries, are really suffering now because you know the price of uh, Brent uh, crude oil in, in London now is about forty two dollars a barrel. Uh, whereas, you know, until a couple of years ago, it was over 100. So a lot of these countries have, you know, um, put their budgets together based on revenues of $100, and now they're down to 40. If they get that, uh, there are downward pressures. So, uh, but we see that uh, natural gas, though, is really important. So Drugmex is investing a lot in that, uh, and it's a major player in that area. Uh, we see that also as for electric vehicles, uh, a lot of the rare earths and other components uh, they're they're investing in and trying to find um, so very important there Fujifilm as we mentioned uh, very ap active in um, cosmetics uh, soaps cleaning products etc um, and doing very well in South Africa but also really expanding its presence uh, Ito Chu uh, will show you a map in a moment of their uh, offices in 11 countries Ito Chu is probably the most progressive um, trading house in Japan uh, trading house is kind of an old term in a sense. Um, you know, so it's like shosha, um, because uh, Itochu is also very much involved in banking uh, and providing financing for projects. So they're almost like a development bank at the same time. So very important in uh, in Africa. So I think if you're looking to do anything in Africa uh, significant with Japanese companies, Itochu is a good one to be hooked up with. Uh, Mitsubishi Corporation uh, is very important, uh, obviously globally. Uh, they've set up a joint venture uh, for solar power development uh, with BBOXX, the uh, EU-based firm, uh, with a good inroads in there. I think if you look at uh, the whole thing of new and alternative energies, this is a really important area for Africa because solar, I mean, there's so much sunshine there. It's, uh, it's a natural. So it's uh, something that I think uh, it's a very smart investment. Uh, geothermal is another area that's growing. Uh, wind power. So a lot of these um, sort of alternative energies, which are becoming more important in Japan and other parts of the world, are really, really important going forward in Africa. So I think uh, these are smart investments. OK, next one, please. OK, this is uh, the Tochu. Uh, operation, operations in uh, Africa. So we can see that uh, the main offices are South Africa and Kenya, but also Ethiopia, very active, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, interesting, Algeria. So the upper countries, Morocco, um, Algeria, Tunisia, are kind of the Arab uh, African countries. Uh, then on Ghana, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. So these are countries that were uh, originally French colonies, um, so they're very uh, important. Uh, Ghana is very important for chocolate, etc. Cote d'Ivoire is very important in a lot of areas. And Nigeria is very important for oil, as we mentioned, and a major uh, country development. Cameroon. So they've kind of been very selective. It's mainly coastal areas, if we see. They're not really uh, inland too much, so they're kind of clever that way. I think that they're uh, easy to move, and I think uh, they've Identify probably the key uh, development areas uh, as they see them in in Africa. Okay, next one, please. Okay, um, so what's uh, a major factor in in developing the cooperation between Japan and the African countries? Uh, the Tokyo International Conference on African Development, uh, TCAD. Uh, was established by the Japanese government in 1993. Um, it's run by JICA and other Japanese agencies. So the whole thing is to bring together leaders from uh, the different African countries, especially the political leaders, also some of the business leaders, for talks. And so initially with TCAD 1 in Tokyo in 1993, it was largely, you know, get to get to know each other. Some of the African people would come to Japan for the first time. Uh, and I think Japan wanted them to you know, feel more comfortable with Japan and, and explore possibilities. Initially, it was done every five years. So, so TCAT 2 uh, was in Tokyo in 1998. And at that point, always hosted in Japan. Uh, TCAT 3 
uh, Tokyo 2003, TCAD 4. Uh, this is a bit of a change because I went to Yokohama uh, 2008, so I slipped a little, side, a little outside of Tokyo. <laughs> okay, next uh, slide, please. So we see then uh, TCAD 5 uh, was in Yokohama in 2013. Um, and interestingly then, I think a lot of people felt that A, TCAD should be hosted in Africa at some point, and it should be two to five years between. It's just too much, too much time. Uh, it's too long, so better make it shorter. So they decided to have it every three years. Um, and so it was very instrumental to have the first TCAD in Africa, in Nairobi, in Kenya in 2016. So this is very good because I think a lot of the African people, it was easier for them to get there. Uh, and it was good for a lot of the Japanese people to go to Africa for the first time and to experience it. And they could uh, spend time in Kenya and then also make side trips to other countries in the region, uh, get to know people. So I think it was very good. And the most recent one was TCAT 7 in Yokohama, 2019. Um, so I went there, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, and I think it was very, very important because, um, again, it uh, they firmly installed every three years instead of every five years, uh, sort of. And I think they're going to alternate it now between uh, Africa and Japan. So I think it's getting it's really progressing that way. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the main themes of TCAD seven in Yokohama 2019 was from A to trade. And this is really important uh, because I think a lot of African countries were looking to, you know, go to JICA or some of the Japanese development banks or others, basically asking for grants or loans. And um, so I think uh, it was discussed a lot. And I think they came to the realization that really that's one way to do it, but you are developing your economies. You should be focusing more on trade. So develop trade ship, trade partnerships. Uh, so they made a really large trade show uh, and there were company presentations uh, there as well. And that was very impressive. Um, so I think, uh, and I was very impressed with a lot of Japanese companies that uh, showed up. There were bigger companies, we'll see some photos in a moment, uh, Mitsubishi Electric and uh, other major companies, Fujifilm, but um, a lot of SMEs, a lot of people with, you know, two to 20 people in the company and they're who they wanted to do business in Africa. Um, I was a little disappointed that a lot of the African people there didn't spend more time there in the trade show. Because, you know, if we're talking from, from A to trade, to do trade, you should be meeting the Japanese companies that want to be your trading partners. But a lot of them didn't go there. I think there were kind of, you know, there were a lot of seminars and, and that sort of thing, which is good. But uh, I think there was a bit of a lost opportunity there. And I think some of the African uh, countries that the people have dealt with too, I mean, it's a bit of a slogan. Yeah, we're going to, you know, move from A to trade, but they really don't know what to do. Uh, we've tried to set up some training programs for them and, and uh, to help them, but they're not really trained for trade. They're trained for aid. So there's a bit of a gap there that they have to, to overcome. Um, so, but I think uh, anyway, there was a, a good effort. Uh, it was a good show from the Japanese side. I think there were some African people who, were, who really benefited from it. So I think it's really good. So it's a it's a really good concept. I hope that uh, they would start to do that maybe every two years instead of every three, alternate it between Japan and, uh, and uh, different countries in, in Africa and really try to build it up to make it a little more ongoing. So, you know, if you create momentum there from one meeting, then try to continue to keep in contact with people and, and go and visit them and that sort of thing. So it's a little, a little challenging. Okay, next slide, please. This is Misla. She was the uh, honorary ambassador uh, for TCAT 7 in Yokohama, 2019. Okay, next slide, please. This is the city of Kobe. Um, so the city of Kobe, uh, as I mentioned, developed a, a sister city relationship uh, with Kigali and Rwanda. We'll get into that a bit more in a moment. But I think uh, Kobe is a very progressive city uh, in Japan. I think it's the most international of the cities of its scale. I think it's more international than Yokohama and Osaka and, and uh, uh, to Tokyo just through its scale is the most international. But I think in terms of really developing initiatives, uh, I think Kobe is very impressive. And in, in terms of really providing incentives for companies or groups who want to set up in Japan, they keep their word, they really try to help. So they've done a good job in the 
pharmaceutical and the bio areas. Um, so they had a big booth at uh, TCAT 7. Uh, they had uh, several officials there uh, meeting with people. So I thought it was very proactive. I think they probably want to host uh, TCAT you know, next time in Japan. And I think it would be good to uh, you know, move it to Kansai and uh, give, it, uh, give Kobe a chance to host it. Uh, because I think in terms of some of the real action and I think some of the real committed people, Kobe's really got uh, some very good, good people. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we can see that Mitsubishi Electric, uh, sorry, the, the signs off there, but uh, this is what their main uh, booth. We'd see a lot of people there uh, as they're making presentations, uh, a lot of people interested. Um, so I think this was again good because this was the trade show. You can see it's a very large hall. Um, and I think there were, you know, well over, I'd say 150 companies or groups uh, exhibiting there which is very, very impressive. Okay, uh, next please. So sister cities, uh, this is another way to develop cooperation. Um, I think uh, a lot of you will, um, you know, you, the city or town you may or from may have a sister city somewhere. Uh, I know Yokohama has about 10, uh, Kobe has a lot. Um, but there's not a lot of real activity uh, in the sister cities, often they'll, They'll do exchanges and you know it's goodwill and that sort of thing. It's nice. But I think uh to take it to another level, I think uh Kobe and Kigali have been able to do that. Um so Kigali uh, has been a beneficiary, I think, of uh a lot of cooperation and goodwill. Uh, the, the the uh develop, the relationship developed in 2016, uh formally four years ago, but I think there was a lot of work done before that. So uh, I think a lot of the pharmaceutical and bio companies uh, based in Kobe were working with uh, Kigali and their counterparts. So that Rwanda now has the number two uh, healthcare system in Africa after South Africa. And I think this is largely due to its contact with Kobe and uh, cooperation. So it's very good. So it's really good. And I think we see a lot of students, uh, both undergraduates and graduates in Kobe from uh, Kigali and other parts of Rwanda. So it's a really good system. I think it's working well. So it's a very good um, thing to build on. I think with, for other groups that are looking to develop their contacts uh, with Africa, it may be good to identify progressive um, cities there to consider doing this with. Okay, next slide, please. So looking forward, um, so I think there's a lot of areas of cooperation. Um, obviously the most uh, pressing need right now is uh, coronavirus. Uh, a lot of uh, African countries need help with this. Uh, so I think for Japan to uh, provide uh, medical care and assistance right now, Japan, we're also battling coronavirus. So uh, it's difficult, I think, to send people, but to send uh, different medicines, uh, for example, if the, when a vaccine uh, is developed uh, to then uh, designate once was Japan has looked after to send some to some of the African countries that uh, will be very helpful. I think uh, also to help with water supplies, so to boost uh, JICA's presence and projects there because clean water is just so important. Uh, I think uh, also to, to do smart uh, loans and grants, which kind of look at what China's doing. China's doing a lot of infrastructure investment there, like roads and, and bridges and that sort of thing. So that's fine. Uh, Japanese general work is better, better quality, uh, but a little more expensive. But um, to maybe build on that infrastructure, which China's building, and then build smart infrastructure. So to create systems that work, uh, that uh, people can use. And uh, so I think this is a really good strategic thing to say, okay, you know, let China be the brawn, we'll be the brains. So we'll really focus on things that are sort of higher level, higher tech. Uh, and uh, without trying to control people, uh, I think often, um, some uh, Chinese groups are investing in, in countries like in Kenya, for example, and they're trying to take over the media groups. And so they'll, they'll provide people with TV sets and to connections with cable and satellite, but they provide all the programming. So Chinese programming, that's all they, that's all they get on their channels. So it's a little, little heavy. Um, education and training. So we can see that uh, I think there's a lot of need for training people in a lot of different areas. Uh, to train them there, to bring them to Japan. Uh, I think it's going to really be beneficial in the long run. 
Uh, and also there, there's a, a growing uh, middle class and, and spending class there that, that really want made in Japan products. So I think um, as we develop that, and I think there's more branding, people become more aware of the products to export them from Japan or to set up in the different countries, uh, set up partnerships, uh, set up wholly owned uh, situations. But anyway, to, to train the people to really create those markets because the Japanese market is, is only going to get smaller. And, uh, you know, the majority of uh, revenue for Japanese companies, most Japanese companies is overseas now, and that will only grow. So, and uh, the population of Africa is growing. Uh, so I think there's a lot of huge opportunity there. Uh, next slide, please. So I think, uh, yeah, I think for Japan can develop more uh, low cost manufacturing production bases, looking at the Toyota model, for example. I know Honda and Nissan are also involved there. Um, I think Japanese companies can provide excellent career opportunities for, uh, for African uh, students and for workers. Um, I think the whole thing of Japanese um, companies and their systems, like the, the, the Kaizen in the automotive industry, for example, or a lot of good practices, uh, and I think loyalty to companies and this sort of thing, something that, uh, and I think if the Japanese companies can really look after the people and treat them well, then they're going to appreciate that, and, and uh, they'll be you'll be repaid for that. Um, it's really really important going forward. You're going to hear more and more about rare earths, uh, for example, and and uh, the importance of that. Uh, Africa's got a lot of them. Uh, I don't think Japan is fully maximizing what it could do there through its uh, own activities or partnerships with local groups or through partnerships with uh, third country uh, parties. So I, we'll see that this is really important. Also, natural gas and other uh, minerals. Also to create opportunities for um, uh, exporters from, from Africa. A really good example is uh, Roses from Kenya to Japan. Uh, it was done largely through the help of a Japanese uh, logistics firm uh, who really helped them with uh, solutions so that they, one of the problems was if you're growing fresh roses or fresh flowers, how do you get them to Japan, let's say in one day or two days and keep them fresh. So working with a logistics company, they were able to do that. And uh, it's a great market for them, it's really growing. So I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities in food products, um, dried foods, uh, you know, there's a lot of very good opportunities. So to really explore those opportunities, it's kind of a, in a sense, a new frontier in a lot of ways. But um, so I think, uh, and I think the other thing is that I think a lot of uh, African people uh, want uh, Japan to be more engaged. Uh, and uh, to, to probably offset the Chinese presence, uh, but also just to help the countries to, to develop and evolve. Okay, so uh, that's it for the presentation. So thank you for your uh, attention. And uh, I hope uh, it was uh, understandable and interesting, stimulating. Um, but uh, I'll be happy to, uh, you know, to answer any questions or uh, have any discussion. Thank you very much, James. Uh, anybody have any questions to start? Okay, anybody? Okay, Rena, can you, do you want me to, uh, do you want to, can you, can you ask us or do you want to, do you want me to read it? Yeah, I, I can read it too. Yeah. Um, so the question is why Africa signs a contract with China or accepts this investment, which is hard to repay. Very good question, Rena. Thank you. Um, I think that, uh, quite frankly, um, a lot of um, countries kind of tended to ignore uh, Africa for a while. I think uh, America was involved, involved in investing quite a bit. Uh, with uh, the apartheid with South Africa, they pulled out somewhat. Uh, I think they thought it was challenging. Uh, EU countries, kind of in and out, UK. Japan also uh, was actually much more involved and then kind of pulled out and pulled back uh, for you know period. So I think China was, uh, because China was really looking at the assets and uh, strategically looking at how they could get uh, you know, more into China. So they were offering these loans. And I think <clears throat> the problem is that 
and this is the Chinese pattern around the world, is that they will identify uh, the president, uh, the top people in the country, and they will quite frankly bribe them. Uh, they'll pay them a lot of money quietly, and then they'll get them to sign the loans. And these are <clears throat> terms that are very favorable to China. So the three people in the country have kind of sold out their country uh, to China. As I mentioned with Sri Lanka, we've seen that with Laos now. Uh, Laos is, uh, as you may know, it's just north of Thailand. It's uh, about 80% of its GDP goes to pay back loans to China. Uh, and China got them to build railways they didn't need, roads they didn't need. They had to pay for half of them themselves through these loans. Now the presidents and the top people got paid off, but um, it doesn't benefit the people. So that's why uh, I think there's a lot of unrest. In Kenya, uh, after the last election, there was almost a civil war because a lot of people were very unhappy with the current president because they feel that he did take money from China. And uh, it was a huge issue, this Mombasa to Nairobi Railway. So it is causing some dissension. So it's often, not often the case that people are aware of or agreeing with these loans, but it's often their, their uh, leaders are betraying them. Okay, that was a very good question. Anybody else? You can either ask or type into... Yeah, just, just type, type it in. We can check it out. Yeah. And Japanese is okay, too. All right, so, yeah, that means you can... Okay, Zane? Zane, did you have a question? No, no, I'm all, I'm all good. Okay. Uh, okay, it, okay, Michael Parrish uh, has just asked a question. Uh, yeah. Has Japan dealt with uh, issues of differing business cultures and ethics such as bribe? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think, I think Japanese companies are uh, pretty savvy. I mean, in cer certain situations, I mean, they will uh, quietly uh, I mean, the reality is, and quite frankly, doing business internationally is that, um, you know, you have to bribe people sometimes in developing countries. It's just the way it is. Um, so you try to minimize that, keep it quiet. Uh, you can't let your head office or your countrymen know about this. But the reality is that, uh, you know, hands are out. So um, I think Japan uh, tries to avoid situations where they have to pay the leaders a lot of money. I think they try to find projects where it's really going to benefit the people more. And if they have to, you know, spend a little bit, JICA is very strict on that. So, cause it's, it's government money, but I think with some of the uh, private investment uh, situations, they will, you know, uh, pump, grease the pump and spins the wheel. Uh, but I think it's nothing on the scale of what China does because what China does is so off the board. You know, we think about, let's say that $3 billion in Kenya, probably a billion dollars of that disappeared. So where, where's the cash? You know, nobody, nobody will ever know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's really good. So I don't think any other country in the world, every, every country in the world has to deal with these cultural things, but I think not, not the scale where China, China actually courts it, cultivates it and puts it on steroids. Interesting. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Okay, uh, no, anything is okay. Okay, Satomi, thank you. So, uh, oh, thank you. Um, she was surprised to hear that Japanese assistance in Africa is so highly evaluated. Japanese ODA was said to be useless with, uh, some time, some while ago. So could you share a little bit more about how it is evaluated, if any? Yeah, yeah, very good question. Um, I've been very impressed. I've been studying what JICA is doing in a variety of countries, and uh, I've been very impressed with them. Um, they very quietly, um, I think, do a lot of great work. Um, I spent time in Laos uh, looking at what they're doing there, and uh, we have a friend who, uh, Japanese friend who did some work with the education group there. We sent on a scholarship to 
uh, New York, but um, but I, I met the head of uh, Laos, uh, JICA, and I was very impressed with the work they're doing because um, they're trying to again offset what the Chinese are doing there, and knowing the Chinese basically own 80% of the economy. Um, but there, um, there's a lot of dams uh, that are used for hydropower in Laos, and um, so basically they're trying to create a grid that, that the Laotians can use to manage that and maximize it and then probably sell some of this electric power to Thailand and other countries. So I think they're really helping them to step up with management ideas and uh, smart systems. Um, I think they've also, they've also helped with the uh, uh, expansion of the airport in Vientiane uh, to make it avail more available for more international flights. I think, uh, again, it's been very impressive to see in Africa, um, especially before the coronavirus, uh, just to see the medical situation, to see that there's a lot of uh, devoted doctors uh, that have been sent uh, for you know, short-term periods, and often they'll stay longer and uh, continue to develop hospitals and help the people. Um, so I think uh, there's more of a altruistic um, situation you know, for, for a lot of the Japanese help. Uh, and I think, again, they're quite serious about analyzing and finding good long-term solutions to problems. There, there's a limit to what they can do, but uh, if they can identify situations like, uh, you know, in Z Zimbabwe, they're trying to help them to manage water flows. Um, in uh, a lot of the other countries are working on uh, education systems. They've set up a really good uh, education training system in South Africa, uh, working with local universities, so bringing technology. So, um, and I think there's, they've also created scholarships to bring uh, students, both graduate and undergraduate students uh, from Africa to Japan to do MBAs and other degrees, which is fantastic. I mean, that's, it's a really great opportunity. It's great for the education institutions here, but again, for them to spend time in Japan, to make friends, uh, to understand how Japan works and to uh, develop the relationship. So I think that, you know, JICA is really doing a lot of great work. Um, so I think it's part, part of it's that um, interesting that JICA doesn't really say too much about what it's doing, kind of quietly does a very good job. Well, thank you. Uh, that was, uh, yes. Um, and uh, Tatsuto Araki, he has a question. He heard that there's an issue between JICA and Mozambique on the Pro Savannah project. Mm. So the issue is, <coughs> this is not people misunderstanding in their needs and how can we prevent those? Yes. Well, I think these always come up because um, often you have people who, <clears throat> you know, have their own ideas about how things should be done. And um, so they'll, you know, they'll say, well, you know, the Japanese people from JICA will say, we have to do it this way. And uh, they may be ignoring some of the cultural issues or that sort of thing. Then I think depending on the people, because JICA is made up of people. And so uh, they try hard, but often if they develop an idea and then they start moving, you know, they're not going to stop, they're going to keep moving. So not, not a lot of flexibility, let's say, once, once it gets going. So that's, you're right, I mean, it's a problem that certainly comes up. Uh, compared to a lot of situations with China, though, I think uh, China, we see a lot of conflict in, in projects because uh, the Chinese people are not um, even sharing anything with, they're not even discussing anything with people, they're just kind of doing the project, and say, you know, this is our project, we're doing it, stay out of the way. Um, so I think, uh, and I think there are going to be problems with any country, um, with Canada, with America, et cetera, where, where they're doing projects where they mean well, but uh, you know, they're not always doing the right thing culturally. So I think you just have to hopefully be flexible and discuss it. And communication is very important. And again, to understand what the needs are and uh, the priorities are of the, the local people and to make sure that you're also uh, understanding that even within you know, countries like Mozambique, there are different cultures and different tribes there different languages. So just because the government says this doesn't mean the local people in that region agree with that. Um, so we find that in a lot of countries. There are a lot of um, boundaries that were set up, uh, national boundaries were set up by the colonial powers, UK, the EU, etc. And they're kind of false boundaries because a lot of the tribal people, you know, live in two or three countries, but they're considered to be, you know, you know, they should be, in, they should be one country, they think, but they're divided over or three countries because they consider false boundaries. So these are situations that come up too. But I guess the whole thing is, is to, um, to mean well, to try to listen, to communicate well, be flexible, and then try to hopefully 
work with people to to combine your your goals to to achieve good good results. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I mean, this is the main main forum questions. Any last questions? Anybody? You either, like I said, put your hand up or. Oh, I'm excuse me. I we we have a more BB. Uh, is there any international law or movement to stop China from those types of bad loans? So these are loans that are are. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the hard loans that you had discussed earlier. Yeah, the yeah, and that's a very good question. It's very difficult because it's a huge issue. I mean, China has right right now has these loans out to about eighty countries um, in the world. So it's a problem in South America. It's a problem in the South Pacific. Problem in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Africa. Um, so I think uh, the problem is that um, the laws are often you know country to country. They're bilateral loans. It's country to country. So if if um, China makes a loan to to Kenya. I mean, there's nobody to stop them because, you know, the the laws of Kenya have given the president the power to to to, you know, accept this loan if he signs off on it. So this is a problem. I think we'll though we'll see there's a lot of activity now in the world where um, uh, Mike Pompeo, the uh, Secretary of State of the U.S., is very outspoken about this issue right now and very critical of China. Um, I think. Underlying it, uh, you know, a lot of countries have looked at the situation in Sri Lanka. Uh, unfortunately, the president who, the former president who um, signed off on the, the bad debt is now back in power with his brother. So uh, it's good for China. But, um, but I, think it's, uh, I think it's really the common sense of the people. And I think a lot of people are much more aware of China's activities now. And uh, when we talk with a lot of African people, they're aware of this. Uh, but... I guess they're looking for alternatives. Um, so they're, and they're trying to, I guess, uh, it'll be interesting to watch this court case in Kenya to see what happens with that $3 billion loan because the, the, the court is declared illegal. So that, that'll be interesting. I think everybody's watching that case. So it's, uh, I think it's probably up to the, the courts in countries there to declare these things illegal. It's uh, hard for international bodies to do it, but it's more of an awareness issue, I think, with, a lot of the other countries. Okay. Oh, where's the money that is used to run JICA from? Okay, uh, KSK, that's a very interesting question. Where is the money uh, coming from? It's coming from you. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's taxpayer driven. Uh, the uh, it's provided by the Japanese government, um, so they allocate. Um, certain amount every year for ODA budgets. Um, so every country has uh, similar situations. So um, so it's basically the Japanese taxpayers are paying for this. But I, I would say though that I think it's uh, generally responsibly managed. Um, I think they're generally doing a very good job with it from what I can see. Um, so I think it's it's providing, I don't know, it's something that Japanese people can be proud of. Um, and. Uh, because compared to some some other things that governments spend money on, I think it's probably uh, money well spent. Okay, great questions. Now, James, normally what we'll do for the last 15, 20 minutes is have a discussion. And uh, if you didn't have any discussion questions, I have a couple that we could talk about. Um, so... I was going to just ask everyone, uh, what more, or what other, what other, maybe what other things, what are other things that Japan uh, can do, Japan and ja uh, Japanese people, Japan and Japanese do in Africa? Okay, and the other question that I wanted to ask everyone was, what is your opinion of JICA? Uh, James, did you have any discussion questions? Um, how many do we want? Oh, I just I just made two. Two is enough. If, I was just wondering if you'd uh, if you'd thought of them beforehand or not. If you hadn't, I think two is probably enough. So I just got one. And what is your opinion of JICA? And then after James, we'll give some assigned questions that they can people will who watch it on the video because uh, we have about probably. Uh, three times the number that are here now are actually watching the videos and responding. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. 
think Zane just uh, posted a question. No, that's me. That's me. Uh, okay. It, this is for everybody. I'm okay. actually, uh, because of uh, the situation I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hosting today. So what is your yeah. opinion? These are discussion questions for everybody. So everybody, as, as usual, what we'll do is we'll break up in a, uh, into uh, breakout rooms. I've made four, four breakout rooms. Please join your breakout rooms, and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk for about 10 minutes or so. Just try to think about those two questions and any other comments.